born in Reading in Berkshire and then we moved down to Exeter in Devon when I was about two, two and a half years old. Both my mum and dad had been married before, um, so I have brothers and sisters from both sides, four sisters, three brothers, but they had grown up and had uh, left the nest, if you like, uh, by the time I came along. So um, mum and dad put me to a private school, private convent school when I was three and a half. My dad had one of these huge, um, I don't know whether you would even call them gramophones, but these huge record players that were in one of these big boxes that the lids would lift up. And they'd play Jim Reeves records and Patsy Cline and Hank Williams. And so my earliest influences have been in traditional country music. So that was what I grew up listening to. Um, and the, the music side of it came about from a school report uh, at open evening one night. I was about five. and. My mum and dad met the music teacher, Mr. Stringer. I thought it was a great name for a music teacher. And uh, he said to them that I had a very uncanny flair for music for somebody so young. And in our local music shop in Exeter, which was Bill Greenall's, they had a little, uh, little six-string Hawaiian gyatone lap steel, basically about this big, which you held on your lap, um, and a little WEM40 amplifier. The guy just said, well, he said, have that on trial. He said, if she likes it, then uh, then we'll do a deal on it. And so I brought it home. Dad cut the uh, the legs off a coffee table, off an old coffee table. And he worked for Coca Cola. He was a sales rep for Coca Cola. So I had a couple of upside down fruit juice cases with a with a, a cushion. That's what I used to sit on. I would rush home from school. I can remember it so clear. Rush home from school, have my tea, and sit down and play for hours. I used to get so excited about practicing and it, it's really quite bizarre because it, from that age you know there hasn't been a day gone by in my life that music hasn't hasn't featured in it and the one thing led on to the other you know I then went on to a bigger Hawaiian steel and then eventually onto a pedal steel guitar when I was nine years old because it was the it was the natural progression really. <laughs>
I suppose I, I get asked an awful lot lately about how does it feel to be part of this new um, emergence, if you like, of country music, the way people are, are taking to it over here. Um, and you've got the traditionalists saying that it's losing all its, <clears throat> all its values, you know, and what the music is really about. I don't believe that because for me, you see, I think one of our biggest problems has been, as far as British country is concerned and as far as accepting country music in this country, is that we who are involved in it have been far too insular about it. You know, we haven't looked to the broader spectrum. And you get acts now like Leanne Rhymes and Shania Twain and Garth Brooks coming over here with great tracks that make the mainstream pop charts. And let's face it, they're more bordering on soft rock than they are country. But at the same time, they're not losing that bit that, that sits them nicely also in the, in the country music bag. And as an artist, as part of this very exciting time, I want to make my music more accessible to the millions out there who've never even heard of me. So by doing that, you take what, what you believe in as an artist and what I've cut my teeth on, which is country music, and then all these other influences of, of people that I admire, like Tina Turner and Rod Stewart and all these like big sort of rock acts, Brian Adams, people like that. And you bring a little bit of that into what you're doing and suddenly you come up with a new sound that sits nicely in the country music basket, but also sits very comfortably in mainstream. So you're coming up with something that is more soft rock than it really is country, and certainly not country and western, you know.